So today's video is going to be a brand new solved true crime video. Today we are going to be talking about the Yorkshire Ripper who was a serial killer from Yorkshire in England. Just to avoid any confusion, yes I have already covered this case before on my channel but it got copyright claimed and so I took it down and now I'm redoing it because I worked so hard on this video. I wasn't gonna let all of that work go to waste, so I'm redoing the video on my own terms and I ain't gonna let no one copyright this one. So if you were confused, that's why I'm doing this for a second time, but this time I've kind of re-scripted it, I'm re-filming it, this is obviously a different version to the first. So hopefully it's different enough that you still enjoy watching it if you already saw the first one. One thing I do kind of need to explain before we get into this video is that obviously the Yorkshire Ripper has been found and identified. However, not all of the murders he attempted were successful and so the Yorkshire Ripper had some survivors. But obviously at the time they didn't know that they'd been attacked by the Yorkshire Ripper. These were just random assaults that were not connected to the Yorkshire Ripper murders until obviously he'd been caught. And so all these women were being assaulted at the same time as the murders were going on but they were never connected until afterwards. However, I've decided to put them into the timeline as they happen. Just to make it easier for you guys to understand and just so that you get a better idea of the progression of how the serial killer was going about it all. But yeah, just keep in mind that the women that were being assaulted and left alive didn't know that they'd been attacked by the Yorkshire Ripper until obviously he'd been caught and identified. Okay, so before I get into this video, I just wanna give my usual disclaimer that I mean absolutely no disrespect to anyone that I talk about in this video. This is all just information that I have found on the internet and I'm compiling into one video. So the timeline of the Yorkshire Ripper begins technically in 1969, obviously in Yorkshire, in England, that's how he got his name because he committed the murders in Yorkshire, specifically West Yorkshire. So just for a little bit of background on the Yorkshire Ripper, I'm not going to say any names, I'm not going to identify him right now, I'm just going to let you know a little bit about his life that kind of gives you an insight as to who he is and why he might have committed these murders. So in 1969, before he'd assaulted a woman, before he'd murdered anyone, before he was the Yorkshire Ripper, this man was happily married to his wife. That was until she cheated on him. And this seemed to trigger something inside the Yorkshire Ripper. He suddenly hated women. He had a hatred for all kind of women that he regarded as promiscuous or sluts or whores, specifically kind of sex workers and prostitutes. He just had a general hatred of women because of this incident. But he never once abused his wife. She's come out since all of this happened, since he's been labelled a serial killer in the public, she's come out and said he never once abused her. Even though she was the woman that triggered this kind of hatred of women inside the Yorkshire Ripper, he never laid a finger on her. He just kind of took his anger for his wife out on innocent women. And so in 1969, the Yorkshire Ripper, who hadn't yet killed anyone, hadn't yet assaulted anyone, was actually out in Bradford with one of his friends, looking for a woman that had cheated him out of some money. I don't know what the situation was with this woman. A lot of people say she might have been a prostitute, but a lot of sources say she wasn't. A lot of sources say she was just a friend that owed him money. But he and his friend were driving around in his friend's minivan when he actually got out of the van and walked out of sight down an alleyway and when he returned he was out of breath as if he'd been running. So he jumped back into the minivan, he was out of breath, he looked like he'd just done something and he told his friend Trevor to just drive and he'd explain everything as they were driving. He said he was out looking for this woman that owed him money when he actually saw a different woman, a prostitute, one that he didn't know, he didn't know this other woman and decided to just follow her instead. And so he followed her into a nearby garage. So he got into this garage with this woman that he didn't know. He didn't plan on attacking this woman until he'd just seen her there on the road. She didn't know he was there. And then he hit her over the head with a sock with a stone inside of it. I imagine that he kind of made this weapon himself at home and then brought it out with the intention of attacking the other woman that owed him money. So he did intend on attacking someone that night just not this prostitute. So he hit her over the head with this stone inside of a sock and after the first hit, the stone actually flew out of the sock. It ripped it at the toe. And so now the Ripper's weapon was broken. He couldn't do anything else in that situation and so he just ran off. 
Luckily, the woman wasn't too injured to the point where she was like knocked out or anything. She was able to get herself up and follow the Ripper to the road to the minivan where his friend was waiting and she was able to remember the registration plate of the minivan that his friend was driving and so she gave that to police however she refused to press charges. Sadly in those days sex workers and prostitutes and people like that weren't taken as seriously as they should have been by police. Police just kind of disregarded everything that a prostitute came to them with as some sort of disagreement with a client. And so this prostitute knew that the police weren't going to take her seriously and so she just decided to not go through the hassle of pressing charges. Luckily the woman survived with no long term damage at all, but had that sock not broken, who knows how far the Yorkshire Ripper might have gone with that. And the next incident wasn't until six years later, in July of 1975, in Keithley in Bradford. A woman named Anna Rogulski was walking home alone late at night when she was approached from behind and hit over the head with a hammer. Anna was knocked unconscious by this hit over the head and woke up hours later in intensive care in a hospital. Obviously, because she'd been knocked out at the first hit, she had no idea how badly she was injured. Turned out that she had severe damage to her skull and slashes from a knife all over her stomach. During the attack, someone that lived in a nearby house actually heard some commotion outside and came outside and disturbed the Ripper and he ran away. And so luckily this neighbour could call Anna an ambulance in time to save her. But again, had the Yorkshire Ripper not been disturbed, how far do you think he would have taken that? Then, a month later in August of 1975, a woman named Olive Smelt was attacked in Halifax, 15 miles away from the last assault. And this attack was almost identical to the first one. Again, she was hit over the back of the head, knocked unconscious, and had tons of knife slashes, but this time on her lower back. And once again, the Yorkshire Ripper was interrupted and Olive was left severely injured, but alive. At the time, none of these three attacks were actually linked at all. Obviously, the first one happened six years before the other two, so that one was just completely pushed to the side. And the second two, I don't actually know a solid reason why they weren't linked, because the injuries were obviously very similar. They were only 15 miles apart. Yes, 15 miles is quite a way, but for police forces, it's not. You'd think they would like share cases between them to see if someone's traveling 15 miles and attacking other people. I don't actually know why those other two cases of Olive and Anna weren't connected. Had they been connected, maybe this case would have been solved a lot quicker and a lot less people would have had to die. And obviously, like I said, none of these women knew they were being attacked by a future serial killer. So they didn't know that his intention was probably to kill them. They all just seemed like random attacks, possibly sexually motivated since they were all kind of young women and they were late at night. The last two women, Anna and Olive, did however make police sketches once they were recovered. And had the police linked those two assaults at the time, they would have realised how similar those police sketches actually were. And then on the morning of October 30th, 1975, two months since the last assault, the first body was found, this time in Leeds. The victim was 28-year-old mother of four, Wilma McCann, originally from Scotland but living in Leeds at the time. She'd been struck in the back of the head twice and stabbed 15 times in her neck and torso. Wilma's wounds also showed reinsertion, meaning that the killer had intentionally stabbed into the same wound multiple times, possibly more than twice. Her body was found with her blouse pulled up and her trousers pulled down, suggesting a possible sexual motive to this crime. Although it was gonna be hard for police to determine whether Wilma was actually sexually assaulted that night. Wilma actually worked as a prostitute at the time. She was working that night when she was killed. And so the tests that would be able to tell us if she was sexually assaulted they can't tell the difference between sexual assault and just consensual sex. All they can tell us is whether this person had sex or not. They can't tell us whether it was consensual, whether it was assault. This was in the 1970s and the tests were really kind of basic at the time. They couldn't tell as much. And so with Wilma being a prostitute, she probably did have sex that night. It was her job. 
so the tests probably weren't going to tell us much. And Wilma's murder actually took place less than 100 metres away from her own home, where her four children were waiting for her to get home from work. So the following morning, Wilma's body still hadn't been found, and her children obviously went to sleep the night before while she was still at work. And so they expected to wake up the next morning and her to be there like she normally was but she wasn't the next morning. And so her children got worried and decided to actually go and search for their mother themselves. My sister Sonia, they woke me up, shook me and asked me to, to get out of bed and put my, my jacket on and said, mum hadn't come home, let's go look for her. This is the spot where she was and we had come within a few yards from where she was laid. And luckily it was a, a cold October morning and dark. So we, um, we were saved that you know, that terrible thing. We didn't actually discover her body, but that's, that is where she was. But the kids couldn't find their mother anywhere, and so they eventually decided to go home and just wait for her to return home. And that was when they got a knock on the door. It was a policeman who sat down Wilma's four children and said to them, your mum's been taken to heaven. You're never going to see her again. It was actually a milkman that found Wilma McCann's body. He'd been doing his rounds that morning, delivering the milk, when he was delivering to a house relatively close to a playing field when he looked over and saw what he described as a shapeless bundle on the floor. So he went over to investigate this shapeless bundle and that was when he realised it was a human body, the body of Wilma McCann. And the hardest part about Wilma McCann's murder for police was the fact that there was no DNA, there was no kind of fingerprints, no evidence, no murder weapons, no footprints, absolutely nothing that could help them identify a murderer. An investigation was obviously launched into finding Wilma's murderer, but police knew that it was going to be pretty hard. Then, three months later, in January of 1976, a second body was found in the back streets of Leeds. A letter inside the woman's bag identified her as 42-year-old married mother of three, Emily Jackson. And this murder was worryingly similar to that of Wilma McCann. They were both women, they were both sex workers, both from Leeds, both had a blow to the head, both had stab wounds to the neck and torso. But this time, Emily had a total of 52 stab wounds, this time inflicted by a screwdriver rather than a knife. And this was quite a difference from the murder of Wilma McCann. However, there were just so many more similarities that meant that the two murders had to be linked. However, in this instance, police had a huge piece of evidence. Emily's body was actually found behind a bakery with a huge boot print across one of her thighs. Along with the boot print on her thigh, there was also tons of prints in the mud around her as well. And as you can imagine, this was the police's first kind of real clue as to who the killer was. So casts were taken of these boot prints all around her body and sent off to be analysed and they were found to have been from a men's size 7 workman's boot. And this gave police a possible hint as to what the murderer's profession was. These kind of boots were very popular among manual workers. However, there was always the chance that this could just be the murderer's shoes. This murder did happen quite late at night, so the chances of it being just the murderer's shoes and not their work shoes was also quite high. So since police had linked the murders of Wilma and Emily, they came to the conclusion that the killer's motive was probably a hatred of prostitutes. And with these two murders now being linked, the news of a possible serial killer started spreading throughout North England, and the media branded him Jack the Ripper. So so if you don't know, less than a hundred years before this case, there was an unidentified serial killer who's never actually been identified based in London named Jack the Ripper, who also targeted prostitutes. And due to the similarities between the Yorkshire Ripper case and the Jack the Ripper case, that was why the media began calling the current Ripper, the Yorkshire Ripper, Jack the Ripper. But then people started getting confused and so to avoid confusion between the current murderer and Jack the Ripper, the media began just calling the current murderer the Ripper. And then as this case started gaining more kind of nationwide attention, he was then rebranded to the Yorkshire Ripper, just to kind of be able to tell location. So usually when a murder happens and police don't have a suspect, they'll go back through some recent assaults and see if they can make a link. But since police believed the killer's motive was a hatred of prostitutes, they completely discounted any assaults that weren't on prostitutes. And obviously they didn't know at the time, but they did have two recorded assaults and police sketches of the murderer. 
But since Anna and Olive weren't prostitutes, they were just completely overlooked. And then, all of a sudden, the murder seemed to stop. Police were expecting a third murder to come, and for a year, it just didn't. And so police kind of thought that the killer had just given up. But it wasn't for lack of trying. The Yorkshire Ripper was actually attacking women during that period of time, he just wasn't killing anyone. He was attempting to kill these women, but for some reason or another, every time had to leave them alive. And so police thought he'd just given up. They didn't know that he was still actively trying to kill women. 20 year old Marcella Claxton was walking home from a party alone in Leeds on May 9th, 1976, when she accepted a lift home from a stranger. As they were driving past Roundhay Park in Leeds, Marcella asked the driver if she could get out and go to the bathroom on the side of the road. And as she did, the driver attacked her. And he hit me on my head. Then I found myself on the grass, knocked out. And then when I come round, that's when I walk all the way down there. Marcella woke up and her attacker had gone but she was bleeding so badly from her head. And so she took her underwear off and used it to stem the blood as she walked over half a mile to the nearest phone box to call police and an ambulance. And the saddest part about the attack on Marcella was that she was actually four months pregnant at the time and subsequently miscarried the baby. So obviously she called the ambulance, she went to the hospital and while she was recovering she actually made a police sketch of her attacker. And once again Marcella's police sketch was so identical to the other two, Anna's and Olive's, but since Marcella wasn't a prostitute, hers was just completely discounted. People often wonder why the Yorkshire Ripper didn't actually kill Marcella that time. He just kind of hit her over the head with a hammer and left. He wasn't known to have been disturbed or anything like that. He just didn't use a knife or a screwdriver or he didn't stab Marcella. It was the Ripper's usual method to hit the woman over the head until they were unconscious and then stab them somehow. But he didn't do that second bit with Marcella, and a lot of people do wonder why. And then, a little over a year since the last body was found, a third body was found, this time in Roundhay Park in Leeds on February the 5th, 1977. Once again, a female body with the same injuries as the two before her a blow to the head and several stab wounds to her chest and neck. By this point, it was very clear to police that they had a serial killer on their hands. Two murders might have been a coincidence, but three are very similar victims with almost identical injuries. It was very clear that it was the same person doing this. The third body was identified as 28-year-old mother of three, Irene Richardson, who had actually been working as a prostitute to provide for her children since her husband left. But this time, the killer seemed to have taken more care in how he left the body and how the body was going to be found. The killer knew that the police were eventually going to find this body. He never kind of made any attempt to hide the bodies of the people that he killed. This time there were drag marks all over the mud where the murderer had moved Irene's body and kind of repositioned it two, maybe three times just to kind of make it the most shocking that he possibly could for the person that found the body. He'd also laid her boots along the back of her thighs unzipped and taken out all of the contents of her handbag and laid it all next to the body. These were not frenzied attacks. This was the sort of man who thought about what he had done and then was concerned to arrange everything about the body to have the maximum shock impact upon whoever came upon the scene first. But this time, the killer accidentally left a huge clue tyre marks in the mud that could help police identify what kind of car he drove. Police drew up a list of about a hundred different models of car that used this specific type of tyre. They found that 53,000 of these cars existed in the West Yorkshire area alone. Police managed to contact around 30,000 of these car owners and kind of interview them a little bit about like where they were that night. But after around the 30,000 mark, police decided to end that inquiry and kind of put their efforts and time and focus into other kind of leads. Because who knows, they might have even already interviewed the killer about his car and just not found anything suspicious about his answers. There was no promise that if they do get round to interviewing the killer about his car that anything's going to come of it. It was decided that we hadn't the manpower to run two murder inquiries and a tyre inquiry with a diminishing return from the tyre inquiry. That was an unfortunate decision because 
the Ripper's car was in fact on the remaining uncompleted list. It was then, after these three murders were making headlines all over the country, another girl came forward thinking that maybe she was a victim of the Yorkshire Ripper. Two months before the first murder in 1975, 14-year-old Tracy Brown was assaulted. She was walking home down a country road alone at night in Bradford one night when she was approached by a man. Tracy never even saw the man, he just came up behind her and hit her over the head with a weapon and she said she didn't even feel any pain, she just fell to the floor. As she was laid on the ground, her attacker just continued to hit her with this weapon. She didn't know what kind of weapon it was. And it was then a car turned onto this kind of remote country lane with its headlights on full because it was dark and this disturbed her attacker and he ran away. Tracy was rushed to the hospital and she actually required brain surgery but she made pretty much a full recovery and then was able to make another police sketch. Tracy's attack was the first known survivor of the Yorkshire Ripper. Obviously now we know that there were some before this, but Tracy was the first survivor to be linked to the murders. When she heard the stories of all these murders of these women being hit over the head with a weapon and being knocked unconscious, she felt that her attack really kind of resembled that. And then two months after the third murder of Irene Richardson, a fourth body was found. But this time it was a little bit different to the first three. The fourth victim was actually found indoors, whereas all the other Yorkshire Ripper victims had been found outside and killed outside. But this victim was found in her own flat, in her own bed in her own flat in Bradford. But other than that difference, all her kind of injuries were trademark Yorkshire Ripper injuries. Although her head injuries were a lot more severe than the previous attacks. This victim was hit in the head so many times that her skull was so severely smashed up that it was known as a bag of marbles skull. That term is basically used to describe a head where if you touch the skin, you would feel all these tiny little fragments of bone inside from how badly the skull was smashed up and it's referred to as a bag of marbles skull. The fourth body belonged to 32 year old Patricia Atkinson who was also a prostitute. She was working that night and it's believed she picked up who she thought was going to be a client at a bar but then turned out to be her killer. Once again the killer left a huge clue, a boot print in blood on the bed sheets and this boot print actually completely matched the boot print at the second murder of Emily Jackson. Like I've been saying the whole time police have been very very suspicious that this was a serial killer they were pretty sure that it was a serial killer but they just needed one piece of evidence like genuine forensic evidence to be able to link at least two of the murders and this was that. In a span of 18 months the Yorkshire Ripper had claimed four women's lives and left 13 children without a mother. So as you can imagine police were absolutely overwhelmed with the public contacting them with things that they think are leads and they were trying to follow up on as many of these as they possibly could. The police had made over 2,300 home visits and taken over 2,000 statements yet nothing had really come from any of those. But it wasn't long until the fifth body was found, just two months after the last one. Yet this victim didn't seem to match up with the serial killer's particular type. 16 year old Jane McDonald's body was found by two children in a playground in Leeds. She wasn't a sex worker and she was actually the youngest of all the victims so far. Now this really terrified the public. Like I said, up until now the believed motive had been a hatred of prostitutes. Whereas Jane wasn't a prostitute, she was just a normal girl walking home. And a lot of women took a slight comfort in the fact that he was only seeming to be targeting prostitutes up until now. Women that weren't sex workers were thinking, oh well it won't be me because I'm not a prostitute. But now the killer seemed to be targeting just women in general. Jane McDonald was 16 years old, she was a shop assistant. She was nothing like the other women who were slightly older, they were sex workers. He just seemed to be targeting women. What sort of a girl was she? Beautiful, well-mannered, cheerful, always a smile for you. I want <coughs> like any of the others. She want a bit like any of them. She want in their category at all. It's just shocking for a young lass like that. She was beautiful. And then, less than two weeks after the murder of Jane McDonald, the Yorkshire Ripper attacked yet another woman and she actually got away alive. 42 year old Maureen Long had been out at Bingo in Bradford with her friends that night when she accepted a lift home from a stranger. All I know is that I've got a plate in my head 
and um, a bit of uh, some of my skull missing and stab wounds up front of my stomach and stabbed in the back. Luckily Maureen's attacker was disturbed by a man walking his dog in the area and he ran away. So the man walking his dog was able to call an ambulance for Maureen and get her some help. And police knew immediately that this had to be a ripper attack. It was a woman in Bradford with all the signature injuries, a blow to the head, stab wounds. She wasn't sexually assaulted or robbed just like the other ripper victims and it just seemed to be for fun for the attacker. Can you remember waking up? Uh, intensive care unit. Uh, I wondered what I was doing, doing there. And I had all my hair shaved off. And, um... Did you know what had happened to you? And then three months later came the Ripper's sixth victim. However, this body wasn't found in Yorkshire. It was actually found in a graveyard in Manchester. The Ripper's sixth victim was identified as 20 year old mother of two, Jean Jordan. Again, she was a sex worker with all of the usual kind of Yorkshire Ripper injuries, blow to the head, stab wounds. And even though this one was all the way in Manchester, further away from the other murders, it was still linked. Police believe that even though it was quite far away, the injuries and the similarities between Jean Jordan's murder and the other ones were just far too similar not to link them. But there was something different about Jean Jordan's body. It was rather decomposed, meaning it had been there in that graveyard waiting to be found for quite a while. But this provided quite a bit of evidence in the way of forensics because as her body was decomposing, fly eggs actually appeared in her wounds. So there's two different types of flies. Some flies like to lay their eggs in shaded areas and some flies like to lay their eggs in direct sunlight. And when police found Jean Jordan's body on the side of her body where the sunlight was directly hitting her, in those wounds there were actually fly eggs that preferred shade. And this told police that her body had probably been completely shaded for a few days at least and then dragged out into the sunlight. And so police came to the conclusion that the killer probably returned to the body to find something that he'd left. She wasn't robbed, she wasn't sexually assaulted, so why else would he go back to the body and move her? Around a week after Jean Jordan's body was found, a handbag was found in a local garden close to where her body was. And so that was handed in to police, believing that it could be Jean's. It was easily identified as Jean Jordan's handbag that she was using that night. And on a closer inspection of this handbag, in a secret compartment in the bag, Police found a brand new five pound note. And police believed it was probably Jean's killer that had given her that five pound note. The killer obviously went for prostitutes and would usually pay for their services, but obviously never ended up using them. He would kill them before they got a chance to. The killer never really had any intention on being a genuine client for these women. He was always gonna kill them before they got round to that bit, but he would always pay them in advance just so that they weren't suspicious because obviously prostitutes knew that they were being targeted by this killer. And so if you paid them up front before they actually did anything, they'd be more likely to get in his car. And with this five pound note being brand new, this was a huge breakthrough in the case. That meant that they could trace where this five pound note originated from. Police found that this five pound note was given out in a pay packet in one of 35 different companies in Yorkshire. And this meant that the killer probably were worked at one of these 35 different companies and obviously got this five pound note in his pay packet. Of course, there's always the possibility that someone who worked for one of these 35 companies got the five pound in their pay packet, spent it, and then the five pound somehow ended up in the killer's hands but police were hoping that wasn't the case. Police were hoping that this was the killer's five pound note. Over the next three months, police questioned 5,000 different men that could have possibly got this five pound note in their pay packet, 
including the Yorkshire Ripper. Obviously, I won't give away who he was or anything, but police found that his alibi for the night of Jean Jordan's murder was credible and they weren't really suspicious of him, even though he was the killer. His alibi for the night of Jean Jordan's murder was that he and his wife had just recently moved into a house and so they were having a housewarming party on the night that she was killed. He even thought it through to the point where he actually gave three people, three party guests, a lift home that night so that three more people could definitely say that they were with him on that night and give him an alibi. So the Yorkshire Ripper by day was actually a lorry driver. He did like long distance deliveries and so it wasn't unusual for him to be away from home for hours at a time every day. And so that's an ideal excuse for him to say to his wife and his family, okay, I'm gonna be gone for six hours and then drive all the way over to Manchester kill a prostitute and then come home. And the Yorkshire Ripper's wife actually had severe OCD and she would make him take his clothes off as soon as he came into the house and wash them. So if he ever had any blood on his clothes, it wouldn't be suspicious that he was washing his clothes as soon as he got home because his wife wanted him to. He just seemed to have all of these perfect excuses for everything to fall into place for him to never get caught. So anyway, the actual Yorkshire Ripper was around the 400th man to be interviewed about this five pound note that weekend. And when the killer was eventually caught years later, he actually said that he could have told the police anything that weekend and they would have believed him because they were so tired of interviewing all these men. Unfortunately, none of these interviews with any of these men from any of these businesses led to anything and so that was another dead end. They couldn't identify whose five pound note this was. Then two months later on December 14th, 1977, the Yorkshire Ripper made yet another unsuccessful murder attempt. 25 year old Marilyn Moore was working as a prostitute in the Leeds area when she was picked up one night by who she thought was a client but was actually the Yorkshire Ripper. So the Ripper picked her up, they drove somewhere else and he parked his car presumably so that the two of them could go somewhere else and when she got out of the car he actually attacked her. He hit her over the head from behind with a hammer just as he always did and Marilyn fell to the floor and that was when another car came into the area where they were parked and the killer panicked and jumped back in his car and sped away, leaving Marilyn there on the floor injured. But once again, the Yorkshire Ripper left some huge evidence, tire tracks in the mud, and these could be confirmed to be a match to those at the body of Irene Richardson, confirming the assault on Marilyn Moore to have been by the Yorkshire Ripper. And so Marilyn was the first big kind of breakthrough in this case. Marilyn saw the Yorkshire Ripper's face and his car. So Marilyn made a police sketch of her attacker and also picked out what she thought was her attacker's car from a lineup of possible models that used those tires. However, the car that she picked out was wrong, and obviously they didn't know that at the time, but this really hindered the investigation because they really looked into that specific car. And then Marilyn began accusing innocent men of being the Yorkshire Ripper. She was telling police, I saw him, I saw his face, I saw his car, that is him all of these men were innocent and proven to be. And so because she'd lied about things, police felt like she couldn't be classed as a credible witness anymore. And so all of her evidence, the model of car she picked out, her police sketch, all of that was just written off. Which is really unfortunate that she had to go and do that because she could have been the biggest piece of evidence in this whole case. She could have helped to identify the Yorkshire Ripper. But even though she was doing all these things, accusing innocent men and chose the wrong car by accident, her police sketch was actually very, very accurate to what the Yorkshire Ripper genuinely did look like. And so had the police followed that lead rather than the model of car, they probably would have come closer to finding the Yorkshire Ripper sooner but they went with the model of the car instead. So the Yorkshire Ripper's next victim was 18 year old Helen Riker from Huddersfield. She'd been reported missing by her twin sister Rita. The two of them both worked as prostitutes in the same red light district area and they were both working one night. Rita saw her sister Helen get into a car with a client as she did every single day and then after that, Rita never saw her sister again. On the evening of Helen's murder, there was actually a brown van seen to have been lurking in that general area of the red light district. And so police looked into that lead, but it wasn't at all what they were expecting. So like I said, that night, Rita and Helen were both working together. Helen got into a car with a client and left. And then two or three minutes later, Rita got into a car with a separate client and they also left. 
And the man in this brown van decided to follow Rita and her client and follow them to their destination and watch whatever they did together. This man in the brown van told police that that was just kind of his thing, that was what he did, that was how he got sexual gratification. He would follow prostitutes and their clients and watch what they did. But just think, had he set off a couple of minutes earlier and followed Helen and her client rather than Rita and her client, he would have witnessed the murder and seen the Yorkshire Ripper. Helen's body was found three days after she was reported missing. She suffered five blows to the head and stab wounds all over her chest and neck. Her clothes from the waist down were removed and her jumper and bra were pulled up. However, again, there was no kind of evidence of sexual assault on the body. A week after Helen's body was found, an eighth body was found, but this one was terribly decomposed. And when police looked into it, they found that it was probably there since before Helen had even died. So this eighth body that was found was technically the seventh murder of the Yorkshire Ripper. It just hadn't been found until way later. 21 year old mother of two Yvonne Pearson's body was actually found underneath a sofa in a scrapyard two months after her actual murder. And Yvonne's death seemed to be the most brutal of all the Yorkshire Ripper killings so far. She had those blows to the head, very severe blows to the head, yet she didn't have any of the signature stab wounds to the chest and neck. The killer had hit her head so many times that her skull was in almost a hundred different pieces. But instead of stabbing Yvonne Pearson as he usually did, he actually used all of his body weight to injure her. He actually jumped onto a chest on his knees, creating internal bruising and a lot more broken bones. She was also found with horse hair from the lining of the sofa that she was found under stuffed into her mouth. And years later when the killer was found, he actually told police why he did that. Another car came over close to where he was killing Yvonne Pearson and she wasn't dead yet. She was still making noises. And so he took the lining out of the sofa and shoved it into her mouth so she couldn't make noise. But before Yvonne's body had even been found, police received a letter and it had a Sunderland stamp on it. And Sunderland is 200 miles northeast of Yorkshire. And the letters were actually addressed to the lead investigator of the Yorkshire Ripper case himself, George Oldfield. The letter said, I'm sorry I cannot give my name for obvious reasons. I am the Ripper. Warn whores to keep off the streets. Old sluts next time I hope. Up. So obviously at this point the killer will have known that the death toll was now eight because he will have known that he killed Yvonne Pearson. However the official death toll in the media was seven because Yvonne's body hadn't been found until two months after a murder and after this letter was sent. But the letter said nothing about Yvonne Pearson or that murder at all. The letter did actually say the death toll was eight but for a different reason. The letter said, up to number eight now, you say seven, but remember Preston 75. So the writer of this letter is saying the death toll is officially seven in the papers, but it's actually eight because he killed someone years before this in 1975 in Preston. So yes, the writer of the letter is saying that the death toll is eight, but he's not saying anything about Yvonne Pearson. 26 year old Joan Harrison was beaten and violently raped to death in Preston just three weeks after the first Ripper murder. And due to the sexual aspect of the crime and the fact that it was all the way in Preston, Police never linked Joan Harrison's murder to the Yorkshire Ripper killings. None of the Yorkshire Ripper's victims ever seemed to have been sexually assaulted, and so that wasn't a feature of his killings. His killings seemed to have just been done out of just hatred and anger and a need to kill rather than a sexual motive. So the writer of the letter is saying that the death toll is eight, but only because of Joan Harrison. Whereas the real murderer, if this was the real murderer, they would have said that the death toll was nine because of Yvonne Pearson. Police couldn't get any form of fingerprints from these letters, but they did manage to get a tiny saliva sample from the envelope. So tests revealed that the letter sender actually had a very rare blood type named B. secreta that only 6% of the population have. And this actually matched the blood type of the person that left semen at the site of Joan Harrison's murder. So police were convinced that the person that had wrote the letter had killed Joan Harrison. And so they linked it to the Yorkshire Ripper killings at the time. 
However, that wasn't true. Maybe the letter writer did kill Joan Harrison, but he didn't kill anyone else. He wasn't the Yorkshire Ripper. Years later, when the Yorkshire Ripper was actually found, he said that he didn't kill Joan Harrison and he actually had a different blood type to the person that both sent the letters and left semen in the body of Joan Harrison. Anyway, the Yorkshire Ripper's ninth victim came two months later in May of 1978. This time, it was 41-year-old mother of seven, Vera Millwood. So Vera worked as a prostitute and that night she actually had plans to be with a specific client that she knew and she'd been with before. However, that client didn't cancel on her but he also just didn't show up at all and Vera needed money so she decided to just go out and find a client at the red light district. So she found a client, got into his car and they drove two miles to the Manchester Royal Infirmary car park where they were gonna do their business. And it was there in that car park the next morning where Vera's body was found with all of the signature Yorkshire Ripper injuries. Blows to the head and stab wounds so severe that actually this time Vera's insides were spilling out of her body. Again, the killer had positioned her body, unzipped her boots, laid them along the back of her thighs, He'd actually placed a piece of paper over her head and again her clothes were rearranged to suggest sexual assault in this crime but again it was suspected that there was never a sexual element to any of his murders. The thing is with a lot of murderers that murder just for the sake of killing someone, not for any particular reason like robbery or sexual assault. They often want to humiliate their victims and degrade their victims, which is often why bodies are found naked but with no evidence of sexual assault. Because a lot of it, for killers that kill people just for the sake of it, just out of hatred, a lot of it is about power. They want to feel power over their victim which is often why they want to humiliate them. They want to feel more powerful and scary, which is again, and I'm going a little bit off topic, but a lot of murderers that kill just for the sake of killing, you hear that they prolong the murder as long as they can. And yes, it is because they enjoy it to a certain degree because their minds are messed up, but it's also because they enjoy instilling fear into their victim. They want to drag it out as long as they can because they feed off of that fear. They want to feel powerful. They want to feel scary because they don't often have that kind of control in their normal lives. Sorry, I went off topic a little bit there, but that is very consistent with the Yorkshire Ripper. So following Vera's murder, police decided to step up the investigation once again and they decided to observe cars that frequented different red light districts in that general area in the north of England. So police would note down any registration plates of cars that they see in the red light districts of the north of England. And if the same car was seen at two or more of these red light districts, they would pull him over and interview him. Because it's understandable if someone does use prostitute services, they will go to the one closest to the house. And so for some men to be going to different locations for prostitutes, that looks slightly more suspicious. Obviously there is going to be a reason for a lot of men that do that, but they were thinking that the Yorkshire Ripper would probably be doing that as well. And a few names just kept cropping up to police, including the murderers, but obviously they didn't know it was the Yorkshire Ripper at the time. The killer and many other men were interviewed because of this, because they were seen in multiple red light districts, and the killer said that the reason he was seen in the Bradford one so much was because he actually drives through there on his way to and from work. But police weren't fully satisfied with that as an explanation. He was seen several times there, like parked or driving really slow through there, looking at the women. Just not the way that you would normally drive home from work. If you were just driving home from work, you would be driving. You wouldn't stop on the side of the road and speak to the women. You wouldn't drive really slowly. And so police scheduled a second interview with the Yorkshire Ripper, who they obviously didn't know was the Yorkshire Ripper at the time, but before this interview could even happen, it was cancelled because a 10th body was found. Almost a year since the last murder, 19-year-old Josephine Whitaker was killed as she was walking home from a grandmother's house. Once again, Josephine wasn't a prostitute and this kind of worried police. They thought that maybe the killer noticed that they were properly looking into the prostitute lead. Obviously, they had officers at every single red light district clocking all the cars and so the killer might have seen this and known that he was possibly gonna get caught if he carries on going for prostitutes. And so the police worried that maybe they'd pushed him into going for just other women that weren't prostitutes. Once again, Josephine had all the trademark Yorkshire Ripper injuries, blows to the head and 25 stab wounds to her chest and her neck 
from a screwdriver. However, this time she'd actually been bitten on the breast by someone with a gap in their teeth. And as you can imagine, this was a huge clue for police. It was most likely the murderer that had bitten her that night. And so police now knew that they were probably looking for a man with a gap in his teeth. Once again, the killer left behind those size seven boot prints in the mud. However, the right foot seemed to be slightly more worn down than the left boot. And this happens a lot with long distance drivers. Obviously, because their foot is pressed against the pedal for so many hours a day, their right boot seems to wear down a lot quicker than their left. And so police thought that maybe that was the killer's profession, a long distance driver. There was also engineering oil found in Josephine's wounds, meaning that the killer probably had engineering oil on his hands, linking again to a long distance driver profession. And then out of nowhere, the head of the Yorkshire Ripper investigation, George Oldfield, received contact from the Yorkshire Ripper himself. Mr Oldfield came in. Um, and just shouted, Meg, can you come over here, please? He had a tape recorder on the desk, and he just said, I want you to listen to this. I'm Jack. I see you are still having no luck catching me. I have the greatest respect for you, George, but Lord, you are no nearer catching me now than four years ago when I started. Tape seemed to have a northeastern accent, specifically Wearside, which linguists actually narrowed all the way down to Castletown in Sunderland. And this was a huge spanner in the works for police because up until now police had been believing that the Yorkshire Ripper was from Leeds or Bradford and had a Leeds or Bradford accent. But now they were receiving tapes from a man with a northeastern accent, so did he live? in the northeast in Castletown in Sunderland and travel all the way every time he did these murders? Or did he now live in the Yorkshire area and was committing these murders? However, that would make him stick out like a sore thumb, having a completely different accent to everyone else. And so now police had to make a decision. Do they follow these tapes as a lead or not? Because they could obviously be a hoax. Do they believe them and put all their time and energy into them? And police decided that they were going to follow these tapes. They believed that they were genuinely from the Yorkshire Ripper and so they went public with them and these tapes were played everywhere, on every news station, every radio. They were even played in nightclubs, they were played just everywhere. Just everywhere that would normally have a radio or anything like that they would play these tapes in hopes that someone might recognise the voice and come forward. And so police began a bunch of follow-up interviews with all the men that they'd interviewed before, but this time they were going to focus more on the accent to see if they were kind of putting on an accent or just if they had a subtle accent that they didn't notice before. The Yorkshire Ripper was in fact one of those men that was re-questioned and somehow he came out of the interview looking more suspicious than when he went in. He was giving very kind of short answers, he seemed very snappy and agitated and police just kind of put it down to the fact that he'd been interviewed five times about the Yorkshire Ripper at this point. He was obviously going to be quite fed up. Obviously they were still suspicious of him but they thought if that is the case that he's just sick of being interviewed they could understand why he was being so snappy but one of the police officers PC Lapchu felt that there was more to it than that this man that they were interviewing looked exactly like the police sketches that they had of the Yorkshire Ripper and he also had size seven feet he had a gap in his teeth, the company that he worked for was one of them included in the £5 note inquiry. And this police officer just felt like there was so much evidence for this man being the Yorkshire Ripper and everyone else was just kind of overlooking it. He felt like he was the only one that could see it. And so he went back to the police station and he wrote up a report on this man that he believed could be the Yorkshire Ripper. And he gave it to his boss, who just completely dismissed it because this man didn't have a northeast accent. But the officer was actually right in his report. He had identified the Yorkshire Ripper correctly. That was the Yorkshire Ripper on that report, but obviously his higher ups didn't think it was. Meanwhile, police were really putting like 90% of their effort into these tapes. They really believed that it was the Yorkshire Ripper on that tape. So they sent police officers up to Castletown in Sunderland. They set up a kind of police caravan on the side of the road and they would play these tapes for everyone that walked past, hoping that someone might recognise it. On the side of this caravan that they'd set up as a kind of standing police station, they actually had speakers on the side 
that were constantly pumping out this tape. The tape was played continually to people phoning up asking him to listen to it. And it was playing all the time in your background when you were whatever you were doing, photostatting, filing, indexing, writing. It was there playing in the background. It was, you know, we didn't have a radio or anything. We just listened to the ripper tape day in, day out. These police officers in Castletown went round different shops and pubs and restaurants just on the street playing this tape for thousands and thousands of people in the area where that accent was believed to have originated from. But not a single one of these thousands of people in Castletown in Sunderland actually recognised the voice on the tapes. The tape was also played to Tracy Brown, who was a known survivor of the Yorkshire Ripper. And Tracy heard this tape and she just told officers that is not the Yorkshire Ripper, that is not the man that attacked her. She told police that the man that attacked her had a very strong Yorkshire accent. She'd never heard this man on the tape's voice in her life but police just kind of dismissed her because she wasn't saying what they wanted to hear. Meanwhile, the car registration logs were still going on in all these different red light districts, and unknown to police, they'd actually logged the Yorkshire Ripper twice in Leeds, once in Manchester, and 36 times in Bradford. Frequent visitors of the different red light districts were still being questioned, even though police were putting most of their efforts into the tapes, they were still doing this back in Yorkshire. And so after these stats came in that the Yorkshire Ripper was seen 36 times in Bradford, he was questioned once again by the man that had actually made the first report on him. The thing that struck me more than anything was the uncanny resemblance to the Marilyn Moore photo fit. I had bad feelings about the man. But this officer just felt like this had to be the Yorkshire Ripper. There was way too much evidence towards him being the Yorkshire Ripper for it not to be. Like I said, he looked identical to the police sketches. He had a gap in his teeth, size seven feet, he was a lorry driver, everything pointed towards this man being the serial killer. And so that same officer made a second report on this man. He believed that it had to be the Yorkshire Ripper and he was not gonna take no for an answer from his higher ups. And so this officer looked into the man's previous criminal history and he was told by the records office that he had a previous conviction for going equipped for theft meaning that he'd gone out, intended to steal something and took a weapon with him. However, what the records office didn't tell him was what that weapon was. It turned out to be a hammer, the signature weapon of the Yorkshire Ripper. And obviously had the records office told him that at the time, told him that his weapon of choice was a hammer, it would have just concreted that this man was the Yorkshire Ripper. Then five months after the last murder, an 11th body was found. 20 year old university student Barbara Leach had been out with friends one night when she decided to walk the short distance back home. She was murdered just metres away from her front doorstep in the exact same way that all those women had before her. Blows to the head and this time eight stab wounds to the neck and chest. And the body placed under the steps in the corner with rubbish and old carpet piled around her. She was slumped in a sitting position with her clothing disturbed and blood running down from the head. Again, Barbara wasn't a prostitute. She was just a woman in the wrong place at the wrong time that the Yorkshire Ripper saw and decided to make his next victim. Then, 12 days after Barbara's murder, police in Sunderland received a phone call from a man that they believe could have been the same man as the one on the tapes. I was in the office by myself. And then the phone went for the millionth time. So I picked up my pen and there was a pad by the phone. Picked it up. A police instant room, Sunderland, can I help you? And then this voice came on and I thought, well, shit, this is the ripper. This is the man. And, and, and the hairs on the back of my head stood up. And he's just saying, tell him, it's a hoax, the tape's a hoax. It was at this point the lead investigator of the case, George Oldfield, suffered a stress-induced heart attack. He'd been working on this case for years at this point, every single day. He had barely any breaks, he was getting barely any sleep, barely any rest, 
and he was just horrifically run down. And so after his heart attack, he and his higher ups came to the decision that it was probably best for him to step away from the Yorkshire Ripper case. And this whole time, it had been George Oldfield that was pushing these tapes. He genuinely believed that it was the Yorkshire Ripper on those tapes. And so that's why they spent so much time and effort looking into it. And so now in the absence of George Oldfield, the other officers decided that they were just gonna drop that as a lead. They only really held on to it because of George. George was in charge of that case and if he said they were looking into the tapes they had to look into the tapes but now that he was gone they decided to just regard it as a hoax and so now a lot of the officers on this case didn't really have anything to do anymore they'd spent months looking into these tapes and now that was just taken away from them saying that it was a hoax so what do they do now? So a certain group of officers decided to go back and look into that five pound note inquiry again from the sixth body. And now they were able to narrow down the amount of workers that could have possibly received that five pound note in their pay packet from 8,000 workers down to 241 workers including the Yorkshire Ripper. So they looked into every single one of these 241 men that could have possibly received this five pound note, including the Yorkshire Ripper, yet they found nothing, they got no leads. And although the Yorkshire Ripper had now been interviewed another three times, making his total nine interviews by police, they were still no closer to realising that he was the Yorkshire Ripper. Then, in April of 1980, the Yorkshire Ripper was arrested for drunk driving. The officer that actually arrested him for drunk driving thought that he looked quite similar to the police sketches, and so he got in contact with the people actually on the Yorkshire Ripper case. But the people that were working on the Yorkshire Ripper case said that the man that this officer had, the actual Yorkshire Ripper, had actually been eliminated from their suspect list. And just four months later, the Yorkshire Ripper went on to kill his 12th victim. 47 year old Marguerite Walls was killed in Leeds, once again with all of the signature Yorkshire Ripper injuries. In November of 1980, the Yorkshire Ripper attempted yet another murder, this time in Huddersfield on 16 year old mother of one, Teresa Sykes. I got to lamp post up there, and then once I got under the light, I looked round and he was behind me and I looked at him and he looked at me and it was sort of like a couple of seconds and he walked off down the path and then obviously I thought, yeah, it's all right, it's gone. And I carried on walking and I'm walking down here. Um, I got like just past the second light and noticed the shadow on the floor. Didn't hear anything, just the shadow, so I knew it was still there, but I still got the feeling that there was somebody behind me. And when I saw the shadow, that's what really frightened me. I couldn't run. <laughs> I couldn't do half of things that you always think, yeah, you can do, and I couldn't do it. So I grabbed hold of the gate, and that is when he hit me. I started screaming. I can remember screaming, and then I can remember steering footsteps running and then the next time I came out and then took me in the house and I still didn't realise I was really hurt until I actually got in and saw blood. How close to home were you? My home's there, I can see it from here. <laughs> Police were on the scene within minutes. They brought sniffer dogs, they brought forensics, and just tried to get as much evidence as they possibly could while it was still fresh. He ran down here and somehow got it. We don't know exactly his route into the back alley, but the dogs picked him up, picked up scent in the back alley. 12 days after his attack on Teresa, the Yorkshire Ripper committed what would be his final murder on November 17th, 1980. Around 20 past nine that night, 20 year old student Jacqueline Hill got off her bus in the middle of Leeds and was unknowingly being followed by the Yorkshire Ripper. And she was the final woman to receive those trademark injuries, blows to the head, stab wounds to the body. By now, the Ripper had claimed 13 victims but still, police really weren't that close to finding out who he was. Still, on January 2nd, 1981, police were still doing those routine checks of red light districts in the north of England. On this particular day in the Sheffield red light district, police checked the registration plates of a certain car. When they put it into their database, however, 
They found that the registration plates on that car didn't actually match the model of the car or the driver of the car. And so the officer asked the driver of this car to step out for a second so that he could arrest him, obviously for having wrong plates on his car. And for a second, the officer turned his back before he'd actually arrested him and this man slipped away. So the officer noticed that this man had run away and he shouted to him and that was when the man re-emerged and said, oh sorry, I was just wanting to go to the toilet, but I'll wait until we get to the police station. So immediately due to his lies about the car, the fact that he had wrong registration plates and the fact that he tried to run away from police officers, police were really suspicious of him and they began to think that maybe they finally had the Yorkshire Ripper and so they kept him at the police station overnight and then got the Ripper team in the next morning to interview him. Police were very aware that this man's appearance really matched up with the police sketches, he had size 7 feet, he had a gap in his teeth everything was just too perfect. But this interview didn't quite go as well as they were hoping, they didn't really get any kind of leads or evidence or any more suspicion from this man, it was just an interview. And so without any real evidence that this was the Yorkshire Ripper, they had just had to let him go. That same day that they let him go, the police officer that actually arrested him remembered that he slipped away for a couple of seconds. And so he decided to go back to the scene where he arrested him and search that area and he found a hammer. There was a bit of conversation as to who it could belong to. He was saying that it could belong to uh, the handyman because there was an oil tank at the side of uh, where it was. And that's when I stood on the wall and shone the torch down and said, well, the hammer might belong to him, but who does the knife belong to? And after that, uh, we knew that uh, the person we'd arrested uh, was the man who was commonly known as the Yorkshire Ripper. They found both of the Yorkshire Ripper's usual weapons that would inflict those signature injuries on every single one of those 13 women. And so at this point, they knew they had the Yorkshire Ripper. So they re-arrested this man, took him to the police station and police told him exactly what they'd found. And he just straight up confessed that he was the Yorkshire Ripper. His name was Peter William Sutcliffe. He was 35 years old from Bradford in West Yorkshire in England. His home was subsequently searched and they found even more evidence that he was the killer. The first thing I saw was a wooden block with kitchen knives in. It was obvious that the second largest knife of the set was the one I had covered in clear polythene in my hand. The one that had been found behind the oil tank at Sheffield. One of the interrogating team came out of the interview room and said, boss, he's just told us that he went back to Manchester with a hacksaw and tried to cut her, the head off Jordan, but the hacksaw wasn't big enough. I said, I know, I've got the hacksaw police station Sutcliffe was asked to remove his clothes so that they could be taken and used for evidence and when he did the motive for the murders became clear. Underneath his trousers Peter Sutcliffe actually had an upside down v-neck jumper so the part that you would normally put over your arms he'd put over his legs and the body part of the jumper was on his body. It was designed to protect his knees, cover his knees, however his genital area was exposed. It was believed that instead of actually sexually assaulting his victims and leaving DNA evidence at the crime, he would just masturbate elsewhere. And so now police knew that his motive for all of these murders was actually sexual, which is completely different to what they'd believed this whole time. However, Peter maintained that his motives for the killing was not sexual at all. He was actually carrying out God's wishes. Peter said that he had an experience in a graveyard once. He was looking at this one particular headstone and he was mesmerised by it. As he was looking at this headstone of this Polish man, he said he heard God's voice coming from it, giving him a mission to eradicate the world of prostitutes and he was to do this by murdering as many as he could. Anyway, a crowd of 2,000 people gathered for Peter Sutcliffe's trial every single day of the trial where he pled not guilty. He did, however, plead guilty to manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility because he believed he was carrying out God's wishes. He wasn't responsible for these murders. Yes, he did them, 
but God told him to do them. But as you can imagine, that didn't hold up at all, and the jury finally came back and said that he was guilty of all 13 counts of murder, and he was given 20 life sentences and a whole life tariff. After his trial, Peter Sutcliffe was actually diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic, and any attempts to kind of put him into a psychiatric unit were blocked. So as you can imagine, a man that has murdered and assaulted several women, coming upon 20 women altogether, is going to have quite a hard time in prison. He was first attacked by a 35 year old inmate named James Costello who had several different assault charges. He stabbed Sutcliffe in the left side of his face twice with a smashed up coffee jar, leaving him needing 30 stitches. Sutcliffe was then finally sent to Broadmoor Hospital, which is the psychiatric unit that they'd been trying to get him in for ages. And when he finally got there, within his first week, he was attacked by another inmate who actually tried to strangle him with a head headphone cable. He was attacked again that year by another inmate with a pen who actually completely blinded him in his left eye and severely damaged his right eye. And later when this other inmate was asked he was saying that he was trying to kill Peter Sutcliffe. Ten years later in 2007 Peter was attacked by yet another inmate with a knife saying that he was trying to blind him in his other eye. However, he missed and just got him in the cheek. Peter Sutcliffe is now age 72. His wife has actually divorced him, changed her name, moved completely. Understandably, she wants absolutely nothing to do with her husband that she didn't know was a serial killer. And Peter is still serving on his whole life tariff, meaning that he will never be out of prison. Okay, so technically that's the end of the case, but I'm just gonna give you a couple of little updates on some different things that happened throughout that timeline that might seem quite unsolved right now. So the man who sent those hoax tapes that sent the police on that huge chase looking for him for years was finally identified in 2005. His name was John Humble, he was from Sunderland, he was unemployed and didn't seem to have much of a life and there's actually full documentaries on this man if you want to find them on YouTube. He served eight years in prison for perverting the course of justice but he's out now and I don't actually know what he's doing. So if you remember in those hoax letters the person was talking about Joan Harrison, a woman that was murdered in 1975. Well her killer was actually never identified and wasn't the person that wrote the letter either. But in 2011, DNA evidence revealed that her killer was actually known sex offender Christopher Smith, who actually died three years before they found out that he killed John Harrison and so he never faced any prison time for it. But yeah, that completes this case. Thank you so, so much for watching this long, especially if you caught my first video on this case and you've still watched the second one all the way until the end. That Honestly, let me know down in the comments if that is you because that means the world to me. Thank you to all of you for watching this long. I know this has been a, probably a very long video. I'm guessing it's going to be about 50 minutes long, which thank you for spending that much time with me. But yeah, I really, really worked hard on this video again. I worked hard researching this case and I just didn't want that to go to waste. And thank you so much for all of you that understand why I am re-uploading this case. But yeah, I need to get off and edit this video. So thank you so, so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, make sure you leave a big thumbs up and subscribe down below if you want to see some more like this. But yeah, thank you so, so much for being patient with me during True Crime Week. Thank you so much for letting me cancel last week and then restart again this week. It just went so much better this week. Yeah, the support all week and the energy that you guys have brought to my videos all week genuinely means the world to me. I am so happy. I'm so happy. And also, thank you so, so much for 250,000 subscribers. Quarter of a million subscribers. That's ridiculous. That's insane. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much. And I really am trying to work hard to get the videos out for you guys because it does mean the world to me that you guys want to see these and want to support me. So yeah, thank you so, so much. And I, yeah, like I said, I need to go and edit this video. So thank you so, so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Bye.